Hey, welcome in everybody to the next edition of the JB and Steel Sportscast, where we are going to be bringing you MLB free agency knowledge about people who have signed and people that are still out there to sign, as well as some recaps of the best performers and games in the NFL of this weekend and talk about the game that will be happening this evening as we're recording this on Monday night. So we'll talk about who we think is going to win when it comes out tomorrow, and you guys will get to see if we are correct. Um, and then when it comes to NHL, we'll recap doing some of the things the last week, who's hot, who's not type stuff, and talk about the obviously players of the week and so on and so forth. But as we first start, Steele, how has your week been going this far as the week this Monday? Well, so far, so good. Um, had a really nice, um, long holiday weekend full of all kinds of losing sports. <laughs> Every single one of my teams lost over the weekend. What about you? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, for the most part, the only team you could include, which I don't really watch them that heavy, but I know they wanted penalties, was the Union, which is our soccer team here in Philadelphia. So. Uh, right, and uh, yeah, uh, Penn State also lost, uh, the Steelers lost, the Eagles lost, the, Phil the Flyers lost, everybody lost, except the Union, which, uh, hey, what well, right, cool. <laughs> so, all right, but other than that, man, I'm doing great. Um, glad to be back on to do the 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 next episode here of the JB and Steel Show, man. Really like uh, the format. Really like doing this here with you, man. Can't wait to get into it. We got a lot of Major League Baseball stuff to talk about, uh, especially since we didn't get into any of that last last show. So we want to talk about some of that this show. And I'm gonna fire some questions at the pro Joe uh, about some players. In each of the divisions, and we'll go from there. Plus, Joe has all kinds of other great stuff he wants to get into. So what do you say, Joe? Fire away, my friend. Yeah. Um, well, when it comes to recency news, I saw they were doing an emergency podcast on the John Boy Network on it because people just literally recently signed when it comes to Corey Seager. And when it comes to Robbie Ray, last year's AL Cy Young Award winner, the Mariners have been looking for an anchor at the top of the rotation for basically since Felix Hernandez was at King Felix level. Um, and that's what they're going to get in Robbie Ray as long as he stays. Of course, he had a very down year before he won the Cy Young, but then bounced back. So as long as he stays in a middle consistency, you're going to yeah. get a very good top of the rotation piece there. Nice. And then when it comes to Corey Seager, I was very surprised with the years and value for him just because he's a very good player and a very consistent player when healthy, but he's not usually consistently healthy. But part of that might be because of the new CBA seems like the DH is going to be implemented. They figure he's always going to be a good hitter. So eventually we'll just move him to first base rather than playing shortstop and then let him DH a lot more often the rest of his legs. I feel like that plays in plus they're already an American league team. So they don't, they already have the DH in the American league. And then now they would have the benefit of being able to even DH him when they play national league clubs. If that does become the case and that does become included, assuming it does into the CBA, but they signed that team's good already ridiculously better than last year. They signed Cole Calhoun who's one of the better defensive outfielders in the game who also has pop and RBI potential. They signed Marcus Simeon, who is was one of the finalists for the MVP last season. They signed Corey Seager, who, if he can stay healthy for an entire season, can be a finalist for the MVP. And then Man. you also, and then you also brought in um, John Gray, who's kind of one of those limbo pitchers that's never really you never thought you've seen his best stuff yet where yeah. you're kind of waiting for him to be able to really emerge. And he's, of course, pitched with the Colorado Rockies, who that stadium up there in Coors can negatively affect you a little bit. So I think getting out of there, going down to Texas, where it's not the – there's it is a park that if a hitter can hit it, he can get it going, especially if the roof's closed. But it's a park that's much better for pitchers than Coors because they have much bigger gaps there in certain spots. And the right. ball doesn't fly in the mile-high zone. So I like all those <laughs> pickup. Um, for the Rangers as they get an A Man, um, this far what. in the offseason, where the other team that gets an A this far in the offseason is unfortunately our arch rival of the Philadelphia Phillies, and that would be none other than the New York Mets. Um, the New York Mets have picked up – Quite a well, few guys. Well, now, 
now Max Scherzer on top of who's obviously one of the be- going okay. to the Hall of Fame even still at this point as long as he uh, passes his physical and everything three years 130 million. They already, of course, picked up Eduardo Escobar, who's a very good, consistent third baseman, or wherever you want to put him. He plays good consistently when you put him there. Starling Marte is one of the best fielding yeah. center fielders his entire career. Great contact hitter, gaps hitter. There's big gaps in city field, so he'll take advantage of that. And he's going to be very good to defend the big gaps when he's on defense. Four years, $78 million. Mark Kana, two years, 26.5. Another guy that's a defensive width, not always consistent with the bat, but he does have the gaps and then also Homer to RBI potential to drive him in if you give him the opportunity. He's just not going to have the most squeaky clean right. batting act. So you think. So those so you, are the two best teams this far, this offseason, I would say. Okay. Uh, the okay. best level of just signing like four really good people already when because they went let's get out in front of this crap and not deal with the lockout first yeah let's see, get a bunch of our guys in where okay. other teams are being patient like the phillies for example waiting for the lockout it seems or kind of trying to get guys right in like the rumored castellanos and taylors for some teams to go before it hits and then other guys are rumored like the um Correas of the world for example to be guys that don't go until after there's a new cba because okay. they're more lingering a little bit same okay. with the biases he's kind of a guy that people think will go after but so that that's that has to be the biggest topic i think going into this week other than these players that have been moved you know um obviously you talked about the uh the players that have all gone to the mets you feel have have done very well uh, as far as in the off season, you also feel that the Rangers have done very well. I mean, thirty two point five million dollars a year for a guy that swings a bat that hasn't been able to play a full season. I mean, that's a lot of money to to throw out there for a player, you know, that has uh, con- consistent health issues. You know, what I mean? risk on a couple guys because Simeon's 31. He's been a late bloomer, but seven years for a 31-year-old, that's a risk-reward type of deal. Yeah. Ten years for a Seager who still has high upside because he has a thing. Oh, agreed. He can stay healthy and you can figure out the regimen that keeps him the healthiest. Um, then you're going to get that. But you really, with both of those deals, with Seager, it's more of a five- to six-year, seven-year stretch. And then yeah. the last three, where, because he's not at that age um, of 31. He's not over 30. I think Corey, Se- or Corey Seager is still, I want to say, in his mid-20s. I'm trying to grab that right now. He is 27, yeah. So 27. he's more of like the first six or seven years of the deal probably be solid where Simeon yeah. you're hoping you still win have some time yeah. in that first four to five years. And then you don't really care. Cause if you win a world series as the Texas Rangers um, in that time frame of the first five years of Seager's tenure and the first four years of Simeon seven and all that. And especially if you win it, cause I think Calhoun was just two years within those next two years, then you know, you're not going to really care at that point. You're bringing in these guys to get the Rangers of world series in that new stadium to keep bringing people in right. down there, Texas and keep growing the fan base there with the new yeah. nice stadium. They yeah. have top of building this great roster they have. So. so now let me ask you a question now, before we get into, I think is the, the big story. Um, but with the moves that these teams have made that that you've pointed out with these players signing these big contracts, is this going to elevate these teams? Is it going to elevate the Rangers? Is it going to elevate the Mets? Is it going to elevate, you know what I mean? Making these moves. Look, we've seen this happen, you know, pre COVID where, you know, all these big major deals were happening with these players you know, where they were signing big 10 year, 300 some million dollar deals. And that was happening all over the place. Okay. And now you're seeing it again this year. And this is all before the CBA because the CBA is expiring and now they have to put a new CBA in place. So now there are teams that are using the current rules right now to sign these players. Okay. Yeah, although the new CBA, 
doesn't have any inclinations of making the cap like making there be an actual cap structure. It just is probably going to change the tax structure. So it might penalize teams to want to not behoove them to be over the luxury tax as much, potentially. But it's okay. not going to actually implement a salary cap. It doesn't seem like where baseball is still just going to be a a luxury okay. tax. All right, well, but let, at the let's... same time. The Rangers, yeah, let's get, to answer yeah I question, want to get into that in a second, but I want to answer, the answer the question. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, they were one of the worst teams in the league uh, last year, 60 and 102, because they were a team building to realize they have some of the best cap in this offseason. So they were a team everybody kind of had pegged, big spender, big spender. They just didn't think they would go as much as they did getting the season, <laughs> getting the city. <laughs> You know, grabbing a good veteran that's yeah, always hey. been consistent in his career in Calhoun and grabbing a guy that people think hasn't found his best stuff yet in John Gray. And if they can find it for him, then that would be a huge maybe even two one guy, probably more right. of a two ceiling. And then definitely a solid three four there with the okay. Texas Rangers. So I think they're definitely going to improve. When it comes to the uh, Mets, they were already all right at 77 and 85, but they were – behind the Braves, behind the Phillies, who were 82 and 80. Um, I feel like the Mets this season definitely, on paper, that's getting flipped to start. The, there's no way okay. that the way the Phillies are on paper compared to the Mets after adding Eduardo Escobar. Right. And after adding Max, especially Max Scherzer. <laughs> Scherzer, <laughs> After yeah. adding Scherzer, who already has dominated the Phillies with the Nationals for all that time. Uh, that's a huge add right there. And then you also, of course... I'm bringing Starlin Marte, who's been a Phillies killer in his career since his Pirates days, and is going to just be a fielding wizard that's going to keep robbing you in the outfield. So I think all everybody from all those teams, uh, yeah, that's going to improve them. Where right now I would put the Phillies behind the Mets, that's for sure, unlike last year. And the Rangers are definitely one of the favorites to be the most improved team in baseball. So Okay, okay. And is that that's that basically is – Due to what they've done in this offseason so far, right? So now here's yeah. the here's the biggest question now moving forward for Major League Baseball. All some of these big names have been um, taken care of now. What is the status on the CBA? I mean, is there going to be a lockout? Are they going to? I mean, are they even at the table talking? I mean. What's going on with I mean, I mean, they're talking, but it doesn't seem promising. Like, it seems like <laughs> for a while it seemed like everybody just anticipated. That's why every article you read, it kind of has this guy wants to sign before the December 2nd deadline. This guy's willing to wait for the new CBA because most writers and players are anticipating and expecting the worst, which would be a oh, lock okay. So the thing you just hope for at that point is the lockout only goes like I was talking to with Andrew on the podcast I did on my Sports Fanatic News channel with him the other day. It only lasts for a month or two, and then in years, it ends in January. You can still kind of report at the same time because it's not like once there's a lockout, I don't think many players are going to go, oh, well, that's cool. Let me sit on the couch uh, drinking a uh, margarita and uh, eating hot wings all day and having a uh, – coca-cola beside me so i feel like a lot of guys are gonna like you did kind of <laughs> in the pandemic when you didn't know when the season was coming back yeah they're gonna do the same thing and keep training be ready so just to just be yeah ready. stay ready where the best thing for that is to try to get it back by january because we saw people staying ready for too long led to some injuries in the pandemic season exactly and then, but also, if you get it done sooner, you can kind of still start catchers and pitchers coming back. You can kind of have it still at the same kind of time slot. Right. Where if you have a lockout, which it seems like is 99% sure going to happen, there's like that 1% chance that a miracle happens in the next couple of days, then you want to make sure it's the quickest it can possibly be. That that That's really all it is um, there. You want to just make sure you can get resolve the issue the quickest, not just for the fans, yeah. which is a big, the hugest thing, because baseball's numbers have been dropping, but also for obviously the players and the the um, GMs that obviously were trying to make these big these moves for their teams were just there on the cusp of getting somebody, and then of course the the deal expires, so then you have to wait. Like 
Yeah. You, th- this screws over all facets of the game whenever you go into a lockout. We've seen it Roger in the that. NHL before. Yeah. Um, obviously, we don't want to see it here again yeah. with baseball um, due to Rob Manfred um, not being able to kind of solve any of the major issues here. So, Okay. So if – if they do lock out, when's that? That's going to take place December second. Second would be when the lockout would begin. Okay, so that's man, in just a short and few days. Guys, yeah, and most of the guys that wanted to sign before then, minus Nick Castellanos, Chris Taylor's been rumored to sign before then. There's a couple guys floating around. Some other guys have been rumored to be either or guys, and then Correa has been rumored to be a guy that's waiting to. If to, they sign before the. The deadline, does that mean they get paid? Well, if they sign before the deadline, they're guaranteed what they got. Yeah, because it's concurrent to the current <laughs> CBA. So that's yeah, why buddy. Are signing, are signing <laughs> so there's the real reason, right? But so, also, the new no, CBA, you. if it's like the NHL did before the COVID started, and it has it go up in converse to actually penalizing more, I don't think that's going to happen, but if it does, yeah, I don't know. then, yeah, you, you just never know there. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, okay, so when do they need to have the CBA in place for everybody to come back in still regular time? You said, what, January? I would say middle of January, yeah, because pitchers and catchers report really early uh like some, february sometimes right yeah, like early in february late january some of them get down okay to team and club okay um depending the mandatory date is not usually when guys start getting down there for most teams you see some guys trickle in before that but that's why i would say it has to be around the january time because when you have a lockout guys that want to come in early can't because the facilities not like the so you can go to team <laughs> facilities right during a lockout so a chain across the door yeah that's another <laughs> that's another thing there so okay. you got to be able to fix this quickly oh when it comes to the lockout but when it comes to more positive note for colorado rockies fans like my one friend joe is there are rumors two hours ago right now looking at it that they are still in to try to re-sign their former shortstop now that is in the free agent market Trevor Story since he's lingered on the market and we've seen guys like Seeger and Simeon yeah. who went to the same team for God's sake. <laughs> um, and then, <laughs> yeah, right. And then uh we are waiting for Correa and Baez, but we sell those guys go. Okay. Apparently it's rumored that he might uh still have a chance to stay. Who knows how high of a chance that is though with the Colorado Rockies is they're still in kind of a middle of a retool okay. phase and not really close to winning again. So Right. If they don't sign a CBA and they do lock out, I mean, what are the sticking points here to this CBA? Why would they lock out? Why why can't the players and the owners come to an agreement? You said earlier that it was uh, something to do with tax brackets and things of that nature for luxury tax and stuff like that. Well, so, it's usually always money. It's like the owners want more of the – it's the same thing you hear with the NHL all the time. The owners want more of the pot. The players want to be able to keep as much of the pot as they can possibly keep. Where in baseball, the players have the biggest piece of the pot because of you see the, sal- the ridiculous salary. That they, okay. <laughs> and, they, and they don't want that to go by the wayside where obviously owners would prefer to have the brackets work better for a little bit less and kind of adjust to like I was talking to somebody that was a scout when I was doing one of the hockey games. You eventually these leagues salaries, if inflation keeps going, are gonna have to adjust to that. Where that might be something that's also talked about in the CBA where that's why certain guys might have locked in early because they might think the bracketology is going to go down a little bit where they're already guaranteed the locked in just like with the NHL. Whoever got paid those 13-year ridiculous deals before they made it to seven or eight were still guaranteed their money for the longevity of those contracts. So Okay, so now the only problem, though, is, is that with uh, the NHL, also, they're, they're not the- guaranteed those contracts. No, they don't. But, they don't sign guarantee contracts like what the the Major League Baseball 
guys, players, and the NFL guys, players sign, where certain portions of their contracts are guaranteed. No, that right? no, that's true. But but my point, my point more was just pertaining to um, what you called the fact that um. I just feel the players and the owners are always at each other for who wants more of the pot of gold, so to speak. Yeah. And that's really what gets into it. And then on the I'm flip side, on the flip side, Tony Clark and Rob Manfred, the, the, the players association guy and the commissioner, I've never seen eye to eye on much. So like that, the, it's not really a good relationship where um, it's kind of becoming worse which you would not think it would have than the NHL's <laughs> relationship with their player association, where baseball yeah. has to further the tide and become worse than that. Okay. All right. Well, I'm with you on that, man. I, well, I, what a- we, um, I would say, though, when we um, move into just wrapping up on some of the baseball topics, since uh, we're at a good marker to hit the last – three to five minutes of baseball. There was a trade in the last 58 minutes as Jacob <laughs> Stahl, the uh, wizard behind the plate fielding, got traded to the uh, Miami Marlins for a uh, right-hander, Zach Thompson, who's a solid pitching prospect, and then another yeah. pitching prospect, Kyle Nicholas, and then Connor Scott, who's an outfield prospect I like from watching on MILB baseball for them. So three solid prospects going back to the Pirates. For Jacob Stallings, who's a very good fielding catcher to add into the Marlins, who also added in a very nice fielding and hitting outfielder, especially in Avisayo Garcia, who is a very good power hitter and a guy that can drive in runs for them down there as well. So I would nice. give them a pretty good grade on their offseason, but they're, they haven't made as many moves, so they're like a B, B plus. They're not right. an A, but they're definitely doing pretty good on their offseason as well. Okay. Well, cool, man. Um, look, we'll we'll ha- we'll try to keep you guys updated here with what's going on with the CBA as we find out. We'll try to let you all know. I mean, we're hoping that everything goes well, but we're not really. It's not looking yeah. hopeful. <laughs> no, I don't think so for that. So let's okay. just wrap up on good news for people as we uh, go over some of the bigger signings in the last couple minutes of doing the baseball, which is Gosman, who is a guy that was on your list. I know we reviewed it before. It went five years, 110 to the Blue Jays. So the okay. Blue Jays um, take advantage of a guy that's really emerged since two years ago in San Francisco, looked really solid. Last year was one of the Cy Young contenders. I believe he finished sixth. Um, yeah. So he was a guy that was really solid in the Cy Young race the entire season. And then also in the Marlins in terms of getting that, this is why I actually now would have to put them at a B plus at least because they did resign Sandy Alcantara, who's an absolute dog on the mound. Right. Um, that's a guy that hasn't even hit his prime yet. Five years, 56 million. So that could be a steal of a contract for that value with the way that we talked about how the market is. So right. that's a good, Obviously, that looks like a lot of money to the normal folk, but to MLB market, that's not – if that guy turns into a two or one consistently yeah. for you, that's not as big of a contract yeah. as most other guys around him in the league. Yeah. You would have a steal. And then the other is Buxton re-signed with the Twins seven years, $100 million, a guy that's a very good center fielder, a very good power-hitting fielding center fielder. Nice. His big thing is just consistency of durability, but he's been better of that of late, so as long as that stays – He'll be fine. And then one of the most interesting signings, I would say, mine is Gray to the Rangers because he gets to try to figure it out in a new park and really become the John Gray everybody thinks, not everybody, but a good amount of people thinks he can be, is Kluber to the Rays because they keep keep trying okay. to bring in these good veteran guys. They brought in Rich Hill last year, flipped him. Are they going to bring in Corey Kluber to keep for the entire season or is another young guy going to emerge that lets them flip him? Who knows? And then Hector, former Philly Hector Nearest, uh, went to the Astros, which was a good move by them. Yimmy Garcia went to the Blue Jays. As the Blue Jays continue to make solid moves, and they don't need a whole lot. So I would give them a B plus to an A minus on their offseason because they're just making the moves that they kind of need to fill out an already pretty dang good roster up there right, in right, Toronto. Right. Pirlo's, uh, Pirlo and Payton's uh, Blue Jays. Um, yeah, I'm with you on that. <laughs> so, uh, but that's pretty much um, what we have for other signings that happened before the 24th or the 24th and back. I talked about that a little bit on some of my YouTube channel, Sports Fan News, if you guys want to check that out. Please check but, that out, guys. 
Yeah, but now I think it's time we move into the pigskin and uh, uh, go into some football, to use an old school term, there you um, go. <laughs> and be able to talk about some of these games where we're not going to start by talking about our own teams because our own teams suck. So let's uh, That'll let's be get in it mildly. Talk, let's get talking into um, Elijah Mitchell and just how good coming back, um, making his return. Goes absolutely ballistic. 133 yards, 27 rushes, 4.9 average with his longest being 15 uh, yards and one touchdown um, against the Minnesota Vikings in route to helping the 49ers win 34 to 26. He's become their featured <laughs> back now, and he's a rookie that looks like he's really yeah. starting to emerge as a very solid running back. He's got good vision. He's got uh, he's got that. And he just has that other gear, too. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. I'm not, I've been really impressed uh, for being yeah, a rookie. Yeah, six-round pick, to, uh, especially a six-round pick. That's what I mean. That in your first season and really stepping up. Like, the Vikings ain't what the Vikings defense once was, but they're still, in order to be a rookie that was a six-round pick to do that against them, even at where they're at now, that's still really impressive. Exactly. Exactly. And and I'll tell you something else that I think was quite impressive as well too, and and that's going to be uh, the the Cincinnati Bengals have basically emerged as one of the top. I mean, one of the fighting for the top for the AFC. You know, the way they handled the Steelers and the way they ran the ball was quite impressive. Um, Mixon had 20 some carries for over 130 yards. Okay. And, and two touchdowns and, uh, some nice long runs too. Okay. So have been really impressed with him. And I, I'll tell you who I haven't been impressed with. And that's Cam Newton. Yeah, he had an off. We talked about him actually looking pretty solid last week, and then this week and he had then, an off. Yeah, what happened? But, but I mean, it ha- he's coming. Obviously, I don't think we expected him to cruise through the rest of the season. That would have been naive. He's not the same Cam he once was. But I you're know. trying to work him back in. Um, I know. And he had a very bad week after having a good week. So it's all about how. Uh, he'll bounce back with the Panthers for next week when they play the as uh, oh no they're on their bye week next week so he has a bye and then in week fourteen Cam would then return to playing the Falcons which is definitely a team that I think they can handle the Falcons have not been Matt Ryan's been having a very poor season the Falcons True, but okay they they did beat Jacksonville by a touchdown I mean it was Jacksonville so all right <laughs> okay I got you um. Either way, I think Cam will have a much better team against the Falcons. Yeah, the I The Falcons agree. don't have much guys that really be able to stop Cam Newton if he starts running past you like he did uh, last week and not this week. Or um, they don't really have guys that are able to cut off his passing on him either if he's really accurate that day and having a good game. But Yeah, no, I'm with you. When it comes to this week, you talked about how good your Bengals are. Um, have been well, obviously they ain't my Bengals, but they are well, the Bengals. Well, well, the Bengals, <laughs> yeah, against your Steelers did. Um, but our Eagle, my Eagles, really, what happened was Hertz had a bad first, hit, a bad start. Who's a guy that's limited turnovers, nine turnovers in twenty six games prior, had three in this game. Um, they had one that looked like miscommunication to game well in the middle of the field there. The other, you can't throw a red zone pick. That's the biggest sin in football. Um, and then the other was something that he just threw it down the sideline and Reger, I believe it was attended to, couldn't um, block it down, but it wasn't a good decision. But he was able to, what I liked from this is he still had 77 rushing yards, was able to battle it back. And yeah, Jalen yeah. Hurts always finds a way to be that keep you in the game type of quarterback, even if he has a terrible week. I found that out about him where like nine out of 10, like if, as long as your defense is playing well, which the Eagles defense has been better of late. and was obviously really good in, in this game, albeit the Giants offense ain't special, but they did limit them to 13. So you didn't have to worry about that too much. 
Yeah. He did start running more in the second half. He was a lot better in the second half. Boston Scott took over in the second half, where both Sanders and he had 64 yards, but Scott was in a lot more, getting more touches, and Sanders was on the sidelines. So yeah. uh, I think there was some stuff to build on in this week. And also, you could have won if Jalen Rickard didn't drop a pass in the end of the game, which was Hurts' best throw. So the Eagles didn't have a good week this week, but there's stuff when it comes to the running game still, especially to build on. When it comes to the passing game, you have to be significantly better against much against opponents going forward because not as many opponents are going to score 13 points like the Giants. They'll get better. But when it comes to the running game, you just got to keep doing your thing, but you got to be much more consistent in the passing game. And you definitely can't have three turnovers with the team. If you're a team like the Eagles, you're never going to be able to recover from three turnovers, even though they almost did this week. They got lucky with how dormant the uh, Giants' offense is. Yeah, I'm with you on that for sure. Um, Giants, that, but I don't even want to. I can't even talk about the Steelers because there's nothing to talk about. They had very little yards. They had very little. They, what they, you know, what they had a lot of giveaways. Right when you when you lose a turnover battle against a team that look this team the Cincinnati Bengals did exactly what the Browns did and they did exactly what the Green Bay Packers did. Aaron Rodgers was under center and they hiked the ball and handed it off to the running back. And guess what? The running back just did all the work and won the game. Okay, and that's just how yeah. that is. That's also what the Bucks did. <laughs> in, I mean, in, you in, know, in, what? in Indianapolis, Leonard Fournette had his best game of his career to have four touchdowns to fuel the Bucks' second rally to be able to beat the Colts in not a very good weathered game, uh, weather game up there. Indianapolis, where Carson Wentz actually did solid himself, but Brady didn't even have to beat the Colts in this game. It was the running game that beat the Colts in this game, and you always talk about nine out of ten, of course. Brady's going to usually be the guy that beats you with the Bucs. He didn't even need to do much this week. Leonard I Fournette mean, you know. was the MVP of the game, took off and had four touchdowns and was the primary reason and really the main reason, obviously, that they won that football game. So Right, right, right. No, I, I can't argue with you on that. Uh, uh, so, and then another when you see teams game. like that, when you see teams like that produce like that, okay? Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's, I that's hard to deny last, that. I think our last game to point out before we go to Monday Night Football would be a guy that people thought because they had Aaron Jones, they wasted a draft pick on in the second round in 2020 was A.J. Dillon of the Packers. Look what he's doing now for the Packers. He's a big boy that can run through the tackle yeah. box. And he's mixing in perfectly with uh, yeah. Jones up there. Had a yeah. 20 rushes for 69 yards, 3.5 average, 8. Eight for the longest, really has been playing well this season, really coming into his own with Aaron Jones in the backfield. And those guys mix really well when Jones is healthy. So he's able to do his thing. Devontae Adams, as always, continues to do his thing at 105 yards. Randall Cobb had a great week of 95 yards for four catches. Mm -hmm. That's kind of a flashback to the old Randall Cobb there. Yeah, so sure. a very good job by the Packers to be able to just sneak one out against the Rams. 36 to 28 because of a good game by Dylan Cobb, obviously also Aaron Rodgers in there, and mm -hmm. also obviously Devontae Adams. So that was a nice overall win for them to be able to scratch and claw and fight that one out. I'm with you on that too. And it was a lot of really um, tight ball games and some really just not that <laughs> tight ball games this week. <laughs> you know, I mean, like seriously, the Minnesota San Francisco game, 26 to 34. That's a pretty tight ball game. Cleveland Baltimore. That was a pretty tight ball game. It went down to the end. You know what I mean? Denver and chargers that one. No, you know what I mean? Uh, the Pittsburgh Cincinnati game. No, uh, the, the new England, Tennessee game. No, uh, Miami Carolina game. No, um, but, but the New Jersey, uh, the New York jets and the Houston, Texans, eh, sort of, right? Tampa Bay, Indianapolis, that was a good game. That was a really, really good game. I thought Indianapolis was going to win that game. I really did. Tampa Bay pulled it out there in the end. You know what I mean? Um, so, but we got a game happening tonight, don't we, buddy? Yeah, and that's the thing we'll just do quickly, since obviously when this comes out, it'll be when the game's happening, but we'll just make our predictions where we have the 3 7 -0 
Hawks going up against the four and six Washington football team, as obviously the Seahawks do have Russell Wilson back to lead them, as the Redskins have, or not the Redskins, Washington football team have Taylor Heineke, who has been a good energizer quarterback leader. He's fun to watch. He's not going to be a starter consistently going forward, obviously, but he's a guy that came from the Alliance of American Football, played in a playoff game, played well enough, impressed his coaches well enough to give him a shot to be a plug-in guy until you draft somebody. Right. And he's kind of fun to watch, I'm not going to lie, because he's a guy when you see him, like, I agree. he amps up your team so much because they're complete, like, he'll, like, wait for the guy to come back and play pass, but... Like yeah, I'm with just you. for like just for like six <laughs> plays in for getting a first down, like on the first drive. And like like that's like a quarterback. If you see a guy that pumped up for you making a big catch for him, that's a guy you always want to try to go up for it for and be able to play for. Where yes, he has fifteen to nine interceptions. You want a better ratio there, obviously. But two three ninety for a guy that's a guy that can also move a little bit back there and get you some rushing yards. He has two seventy six this year. That's pretty solid, and a guy that I think could make a career as a backup and maybe one of those journeyman plugger guys that just continues to kind of plug into a roster that's waiting for somebody else to be drafted, waiting for their kind of next best quarterback type. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you. A couple things I want to point out here about this game. Uh, The Washington football team has the eighth-ranked defense um, against yeah. the 31st ranked offense. That's uh, why- <laughs> yeah, look, I understand Russell Wilson is back, but he's only completing 35.1% of his third down passes, and that's the lowest of any passer going right now. Okay, now I, I know he's only played in a limited number of games because he missed um, a number of games with the the, the hand surgery, the thumb surgery, or the the thumb injury, or whatever. But that's just not the Russell Wilson that we're used to seeing. Okay, and I, quite frankly, I just don't think Seattle has the team around him this year. You know, and and I think the Washington team now they're they've won two in a row where they've scored more than 27 points in the last two games out out of their bye. Okay. So can they keep it going? They have a much better ranked defense. Okay. They have a better ranked rushing uh, attack, uh, passing eh, offense, eh, but it's, it's going to be one of those grind it out, you know, uh, 16 to 13 games or something crazy like that. Like, that's just kind of what I think it is. And I, I in fact, I'm going to go 20 to 17. The Washington football team wins. I'm, I'm sorry to go against my buddy. Who's a big Seattle fan. Uh, but I just, I can't see Seattle pulling this out. Um, I, I believe this is actually in Washington as well too. So yeah, yeah, mm, yeah don't see Seattle doing this one. No, um, yeah, I agree. The defense of Washington combined with the fact that they're actually scoring a late, like they put up 29 on the uh, Bucks, which is a very solid defense. Well, yeah, you can say the Panthers are what they are now. They're just a solid in the middle 500, maybe finishing team, two games below 500 finishing team. But they beat the Bucks and were able to get it done against them. That's I mean. <laughs> um, so... I think this team is definitely trending in the right direction, but yeah. uh, this yeah, is yeah. going to be a game that I think with the way they're trending, with the way their defense has been all year, like you said, they should be able to win as we can now in the final 10 to 12 minutes move into some of our NHL talk that we uh, want to I get. agree. I agree, man. I'll tell you what, though. Um, this is going to probably – look, I know it's the Washington football team, but – on paper, this looks like this is a good matchup, so this might be a game worth checking out. I mean, if you just want to watch a, a a solid defensive game played here, I guess this is going to kind of be your game, you know. Or you could switch over and watch some hockey. <laughs> what do you think, man? Yeah. No, yeah, yeah that's, um, that's true where when it comes to uh, hockey of late, the team that just keeps killing it, they have 12 wins um, in a calendar month, which is the best in their franchise history. That doesn't happen for this team, really, is the Toronto Maple Leafs uh, that we talked about last week. And they still then proceeded to do even better and went 9-1 and one in their last 10 <laughs> uh, on a four-game winning streak. 
as their next game is not going to be the easy one. This is going to be the real test, which is not tonight. I believe it's tomorrow when the Toronto Maple Leafs play. Um, it's either tomorrow or Wednesday. I'm trying to find. It's Wednesday. Wednesday, Wednesday. they play the Colorado Avalanche. Yes, the next sir. Opponent, who's mm-hmm. another hot team. So how is that opponent, how are they going to do there? But they've already got past some good opponents in this stretch they've been in as well. So right. the Maple Leafs, yeah, obviously you need to see it in the postseason. But for right now, we're just talking about wow. the regular season. They're really getting it done, and they're doing better in every statistic superior to last season, much better early on. They're one of the hottest teams, if not the hottest team, obviously, early on this season. Couldn't disagree with you at all. Of course, you also have to give it up to Carolina Panthers, who are still pretty smoking hot um, as well in the month. Um, last month, this month, every month so far, they've just been pretty much top in the league in, in almost every category uh, that you want to think of. Carolina is there. And then, of course, Florida and Toronto. I mean, we saw Toronto um, come out of the gates really well last season and then – they got to the playoffs and the tires fell off literally. <laughs> oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like, like I, yeah, I hear the playoff talk on like the reddits and all that. And like, whenever I watch people like the hockey guy talked about that, but all you can talk about right now is what they're doing now. Once the playoffs right. come, they have to show up for the postseason. They probably want to be able to rest a little bit. Their goaltender more and figure out that there, whether Hall emerges as a backup because of Mrazic being a, inconsistent health wise guy solid talent when he's on the ice as a backup but not healthy enough to be consistently one uh, you got to figure that out so he's not taxed but all you can talk right. about now is just how impressive the regular season has been exactly i think there's a couple things that we do need to talk about um that have happened within the last uh last little bit here um within the nhl um and that is the fact that uh, the Canadians have fired uh, Bergevon um, and have hired, uh, is that Gordon? Jeff Gordon, yeah, the guy that was a surprising fire to many when he got fired by the New York Rangers. Oh, oh okay, he was That's the guy. The guy oh, was- oh, yeah, yeah, all right, all right, all right, okay. I mean, I didn't think he was doing that bad with the Rangers to begin with. He wasn't. That's why when he got fired, you got people on Sportsnet going, huh? The, 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 so the now he's going to be the coach of the Canadians. Good prospects with, uh, yeah. Well, no, he's going to be the uh, assistant. I think it's the assistant VP or something like that of hockey oh, okay. operations is what uh, Gordon is, um, where he's basically for now, because they want a guy that's one of those French Canadian GMs so they can speak the both languages and talk to the English fans and talk to the fans that speak French. So he's kind of filling in that role to just have that and do the um, overseeing operations, the bigger role he has while also doing the GM role until they find one. But right. he's a great guy to bring in because you saw him draft well. And you saw oh, him yeah. build one of the better prospect systems in the game right now <laughs> in, the, in the Rangers prospect system. So that was a very smart guy to bring in. But just to think Bergevin – would be going this quickly after that insane run when he was on the final year of his contract. Uh, Like, this is how bad it had to be. Like, it's literally, like, it had to be this bad. You're minus 29 in goal differential. You're doing putrid defensively. You're not defending your goaltending at at all. You look out of position a lot on defense, 9 out of 10. This is really how bad it had to be for a guy that had that unpredicted of a run in last season to be able to get fired. And and at this point he kind of did deserve it because it was that bad. They yeah. didn't, they didn't show up this year. And then I think obviously soon, um, unless if um, Gordon or whoever comes in new um, to the GM role wants them, you're probably going to see the coach I would think be, would be the next uh, right. move there to, to move on from uh, Ducharme there. Unless if you yeah. think Dominic Ducharme is the right guy be with just the wrong it basically play like players. players at his helm right now due to the fact that price isn't in yet and um he doesn't have True. the same depth that some Weber past song. Canadians have had. Yeah. But. yeah. No, I'm with you. I'm with you. But um the fact that that has happened already, 
um, is I think is a big story as well too. Um, two, did, should we go? Uh, look, I know we're we both bleed black and orange, and we're trying to avoid the inevitable because anyway. So let's talk about the cross state rivals and what they've done in the last little bit here. So how about Malkin starting to skate? Yeah, he's going to be uh, contactless uh, with the team. So that's a very uh, good sign for, obviously, Pittsburgh and their fans. Is Their team is 6-4 in the last 10, and they're now yeah. in the second wild card spot, even points-wise with Columbus, but Columbus yep. has a breaker right now. Yeah, they do. Uh, so they're in the first wild card spot. The next opponent for Pittsburgh is Calgary. The next for Columbus is Nashville. Um, but... Yeah, I mean, that's going to be a great sign for them since they have Crosby coming off of COVID, still working his way back. Um, Kapanen's a guy that I think they still want to get a little yes. bit out of, and I expect them to get more out of because I've always liked him as a player and was not happy when he went to the uh, <laughs> I agree um, with you 100%. Uh, I'm but, with you on that one, Pro Joe, but, because, um, yeah, his he uh, very impressive. He would be a really good fit in black and orange. Oh, sorry, did I say that out loud? Yeah, no. Um, and then, yeah, I agree with that. And then you also have teams when it comes to the Devils have um, kind of, after having a solid start, been more in like the middle, just like the Flyers, where they, of course, took advantage of our Flyers, but have been more in that limbo. The Bruins, like I said, are kind of where, like, I expect them to be fighting for it to the end more this year, where they're not the normal Boston Bruins that or Agreed. just right there in the first wild card or right there in one of the, especially in the top three, which is where they're usually positioned there. Yeah. I don't think this is the same team, but this is a team that can get there with the youngsters like Frederick, others on their team. That, you know, that I agree. Team. Oh, no, I agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's guys that they just need to show it um, first with this year. This is a completely different roster and one that until they do resign them, they don't have to go risk. So unless if they do actually resign them at a certain point, they have Swayman who I really like. And all Mark who did his thing in Buffalo was one of the few guys like Jake McCabe who actually performed well in that dumpster fire of a situation. So, um, <laughs> I'm, with I'm with you. That, yeah. So I That's mean, true, that, he did. that he kind well. of is how that, how that was. But I, I feel like in terms of, Overall league, though, one guy I do like just because I've always liked him as in, in his entire career that obviously was a former, I want to say, seventh overall pick with the Arizona Coyotes um, is uh, Keller, who actually has 13 points, five goals, eight assists in 21 games this year with the Coyotes and is starting to show what he was when he came in, which everybody said he was one of those really smart players that could think with the speed that he's able to move with and kind of yeah. make decisions on the fly. And um, that's what he was able to do early on in his career in his 65 point season uh, at only the age of 19. And then he had a 47 point season, which they paid at 20. Then he's kind of been a little bit lesser since he, if, if he keeps going at this pace or picks it up a little bit more, it seems like he's starting to kind of return to form. And what people don't realize is he came up so young. The dude's not even at his prime age yet. He's only yeah. years old. Yeah, yeah, I mean, good great. Yeah. When you come up that young, you know what I mean. You're see, that's a lot of fans and a lot of people don't realize sometimes that these players are really young when they first hit the ice. You know what I'm saying? They don't realize that they're 18, 19, 20 year olds. You know what I'm saying? And and they need that little bit of time to mature and and grow into things. You know, look. Just because you're starting out there playing hockey doesn't necessarily mean you know everything about that position. That just means you're better than the guy behind you. You know? So, exactly. Right? You know? So, yeah, you might be 18 years old, but you're the best guy out there. So guess what? You're learning on the fly. <laughs> you know, you have to get experience and learn the game and learn that experience on the fly by being out there because you're talented enough to be out there ahead of everybody else behind you. Yeah. Yeah. And especially for a player like Keller, who if you're a guy, I feel like some other players that have the needs to develop skating tag teams do them dirty when they bring them up. Quick Agreed. Don't let them, like, that's why uh, I've, I've always thought that way with Dylan Strome, who, of course, is on the Blackhawks now. Um, yeah. But when it comes to guys like him that are always that you talk about their speed, 
stays up with their mind speed, that they can make the quick passes as quick as they're actually skating and accelerating. Those guys exactly. don't mind bringing up right away because they don't have to work on their skating. They just need to work on their hands being at the NHL level rather than being at great junior level. Basically. Exactly. Stuff. Exactly. So, Perfect but, analogy. Perfect yeah, analogy. But a guy know? this year that needs to just become the Rangers captain, for God's sake. I mean, the dude has 18 points. What do you think he's trying to tell you here? Is, uh, it is cr- okay, but see, no, wait, hold on, hold on. Time out, time out, time out. Hold on. Look, uh, I am, I am all about electing a captain who is a leader. I would not want, just because you're the guy who scores the most goals doesn't necessarily well, that's not make always, you the that's captain. That's not really why I would want Chris Kreider as my captain. He's always been the heart and soul of the I'm with you. I'm with you. Team. I just wanted to make sure that we have that differentiation. You know what I mean? Because I, I agree there are teams out there that the guy that scores the most goals and the guy that's the most talented on the team is the captain. Mm-hmm. Okay. I, 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 right. Okay. I, I get it. All right. That makes complete sense. I, I get it. If he's that good. All right. But not everybody that's that good is captain material. That's true. But I also realize more like from listening to biz and other people over time, like those inside the locker room type podcasts that are with the former players, your assistant captains tend to be more of the vocal guys. Nine out exactly. of 10. Exactly. In your captains anyway. Yep. So your captain's really like if he's just a guy like uh, Kreider who's vocal when he wants to be, but also just leads by really good example. That's a very good, solid captain like a Drew that's always led more by example than vocalization where he's let mm-hmm. Jake Voracek when he was here be the assistant captain that would literally get in your face and tell you that you suck tonight and need to get your head out of your you-know-what in order to be better in the <laughs> next game. Um, so that, that's pretty much how that would go, where this year you have Yandel, who is more of a talker in your team because Hazy's injured, so he's not always around the team. Otherwise, I would have said him. Yeah. But yeah. Um, that's kind of what it is. But, yeah, I agree with that. He should be the captain, though, more because he's always been the hard. I said it before on our show, the heart and soul of that Rangers team. That's why I thought – he was a guy as you were rebuilding and kind of building it back up. You shouldn't have got rid of because some guys you have to keep in yeah. that are just kind of the fan favorite foundation pieces of your team. Exactly. Exactly. And those are the kinds of pieces that are few and far between and hard to come by. You know what I mean? So I'm, I'm all for keeping those guys uh, on the team. And, and I just wanted to differentiate that because I know there's some teams out there that have that situation, but, in this case with the New York Rangers, I think Kreider is, should be the guy. Um, I know they talked to Panarin about doing it and he outright refused to do it. Uh, you know what I mean? Um, he said he didn't want that responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like Panarin's more of, I'm trying to think of the guy that's on the tip of my tongue right now where he took a days or He took the captaincy and then decided this ain't really for me. Let's give it to somebody else. And he was a heck of a player, a fan favorite himself, a guy that everybody loved. But the yeah. captain seat's just not for everybody. Agreed. Agreed. And and not everybody who is necessarily the best player on the team can be the captain. You know, sometimes, no, sometimes it's, it's not the best player on the team. Because right. Jason Smith was not the best player on the no, team. No, by any so, stretch of the word. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you. You know, I'm with you. <laughs> Darian Hatcher was not. The best player on the ice, you know? Okay, come well, on. I'm he see. was a guy that was back then especially a great captain because back then you could still get away with a lot more physical, just right. beat the crap out of your stuff, and that's the type right. of defense. Was, oh, yeah. man. I, dude, watching him play from Dallas, holy moly. That dude was a – all right. He, okay, now I understand why we got Chris Pronger. <laughs> oh, right? Yeah, right, you know. All right, anyway. So, but how about two guys like, wrap up this video um, towards the end here? How about Getzlaff uh, in, as a veteran player having 19 assists tied for fifth in the league um, this year? He only has the one goal, but he's not really paid to score goals, especially at this point uh-huh. of his career, to score goals earlier in his career, along with his great assist totals. But he's always been that assist wizard, 722 in his career to 280 goals. And he's really having a stellar season about to turn uh, 36 to 37 um, eventually. So, 
I mean, that's a huge feat for him to be able to have 20 points in 22 games. I'm yeah, with you, that. man, on that for sure. Uh, I'm also really, really going to talk about Troy Terry. Man, did he not just have a stretch of games there? Right? What was it, 16, 17 games? Or 18, yeah, I'm yeah, sorry? Like that. I can't remember the team total, but, yeah, he was on a ridiculous streak. And uh, I remember he – hold on, I have it here where – He's got 21 games played, 13 goals, yeah. 10, 10 assists for 23 points already. I'm going to do videos on the old guys because I have magazines from, like, the old prospect things. I'm going to do videos on comparing to what oh, okay. they should be. All right, Terps I mean – In the draft, it was like – I can't find him right now, but he was ranked like insanely low compared to like where you would uh, definitely. So check this out, right? Fifth round, fifth round draft pick, 27th, 148th overall is where he was picked in 2015, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah we're talking about, yeah, Terry, so yeah. Yeah, 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 Troy Terry, yeah, 24 years old, but <laughs> all right. Yeah, he's sure. developing. He's a yeah. When Pirlo, I think we said it was last week on the show. He's developing into a mid round star. Like you don't normally those mid round guys. Like Lance has wrote in articles before. I think it's like a twenty. Like it might be once it gets past the fourth round, a teens percent chance. But yeah, 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 yeah. Chance that you're going to even make it and then make it and be that much of an impact is a completely exactly. Different thing. Now, exactly. other than the slew foot and unsportsmanlike move by this otherwise gentleman that was once a part of the Philadelphia Flyer. Um, there's another guy that's having a very solid season this year in 16 points, 12 goals in 21 games, and is also one of the league's um, best plus minus players tied for fifth is Ryan Hartman. Hartman oh, yeah. Wild is absolutely going ballistic, and minus that one really undisciplined play. Um, he <laughs> One <his>, undisciplined play. <laughs> uh, well, he has more, but he's not – He's the, he didn't he's never done what Brendan Lemieux's done. I'm we with didn't you. get into that in this episode where Brendan Lemieux bit Brady Kachuk Kachuk had the right to say everything he said about Brandon Lemieux afterward. I um, mean, what? Then, <laughs> I don't okay. think they would announce that suspension yet because he has an in person hearing, but when you have an in person hearing, that usually means it's gonna be a longer end suspension. That's yeah. why they for the in person hearing so you can try to convince them like what the heck did you do that for? And then they lower it a little bit exactly there, which i don't see happening but another guy that continues to just do well with the caps too as this is my last guy because he's a fifth round pick too you did a fifth round pick and terry i'll do a fifth round pick and nick jensen yeah uh, there you uh, go yeah he's a guy that didn't look like he was really even finding it fully at <laughs> times in his times in detroit yeah. Comes over to the Washington Capitals, has been playing 19, sometimes 20 some minutes a night. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is the league's plus minus leader, or second, no, tied for first. Yeah, he's tied for first with Winholm. He keeps going, but that, those guys keep going back and forth. Going back and tied. forth. Yeah, yeah. And then Still but, well. yeah, tied for first with Winholm now, who also is having a heck of a season as Elias right. Winholm is emerging as one of the game's more productive two way center. Exactly. Exactly. Man, I'll tell you what, I've been really impressed with this hockey season and what these players have been able to do um, with having the shortened season last year and now coming into the full season this year, right? We also didn't even mention the fact that the New York Islanders suspended, what, two games, right? Yes, because of, yeah, the COVID. Protocol. COVID, they had eight players on the protocol list. But now... I'm scratching my head here a little bit because Ottawa had to have 10 before they were. Well, I think they should have done both of those teams quicker because you had both teams fielding Bellevue. I you, agree. Well, Ottawa was fielding Bellevue's team a lot. And then you had. I Rich agree. Pulled up for the. Island. I agree. But why but did they. never have changed it. This is an off topic thing, but should never have changed their AHL logo, which was one of the better AHL logos. Then they decided to call themselves the Bridgeport Islanders. That was a mistake. But that's. that's you know, right. That's 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 here and there. But why? Why did they allow Ottawa to go to 10 and then they only allowed New York to go to eight? I agree with you that they should have called them sooner i'm wondering if that's prospect depth like the league i don't think i can't see the league paying i saw that i saw but. that there were 10 players 
on the Ottawa Senators, 10 of the players on the roster that were on the COVID list. And they had to bring up other guys from, you know, the AHL and, and everywhere else. Whereas the Islanders only have eight players on the list. Okay. So uh, I'm not trying to play tit, tick for tack here, but if you're going to call it for one, then you got to see this. This is kind of like the, 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 the whole thing here for the NHL. It's, it goes with the refs. It goes with everything else. They call it one way for one team, but they don't call it another way for another team is what I'm getting at. Okay. Oh yeah. Yeah. They okay. should have stopped both of those. There should be a cap. That's like seven players. See probably. now we talked about this on the off the wall hockey show that there is nothing written in any of the protocols that says if a team gets to a certain number of players, that the, the NHL can step in and, and start postponing games. None of that language is in any of the protocols that have been published by the That's NHL. That's because they would rather have the team keep just saying, like the Sixers basically did in basketball, because the Sixers had a lot of guys out with the COVID uh, list. Yeah. And the NBA never postponed any of their games. Like, basically just suck it up and figure it out type thing. And which is basically what they told Ottawa until finally yeah. they had 10 players, which let's face it, 10 out of 23, that's pretty much half. Oh, yeah, you're calling up a lot of guys from Belgium. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And then a lot of guys from the ECHL were moving up to yeah. actually have enough guys to play into the AHL at that point. Whereas eight players is a much easier way to substitute guys. There's That's two less bodies that you have to substitute. You know what I mean? Oh, so, yeah. I mean, uh, I don't know why the NHL waited long. I think it's literally just uh, whatever they notice how bad that team is, whether it's 8, 10, 11, 9, I 7. Mean, I don't know. They're going to go, oh, we should probably do something about this now. But, yeah, it, it is completely skewed um, how they do that there, and that's something they have to do a better job at. And then you point it out as my closing point for this show before I share where you can find me is the refing. The refing is something we'll talk about more because I'm assuming it's going to persist. I don't see it just turning into a immaculate thing in the next week. So we'll talk about more in the oh. um, next show coming forward. Teaser. Kind of, <laughs> like for example, um, in that game that Dallas still could have won, but probably wouldn't have won four to one that the Edmonton Oilers played, for example, as one game. And then also the Flyers getting Fairby stick slashed into the 19th century. And then them not calling the penalty and then having the score there by Ekblad. Uh, right. So where you can find me is at the Sports Fanatic News YouTube and, of course, on the great thegreatsteelflyers.com, as well as writing for Flyers, Phantoms, and Royals on Flyers Nitty Gritty that I have an article that came out on one of the guys from my high school, my alma mater. Oh, it, nice. It, who ended up playing for the Phantoms for one game at least. He signed to a PTO. So pretty cool story there. Yeah. yeah. All right. I can't wait to read that one, man. That's for sure, dude. Uh, uh, so um, thank you very much, Joe, for doing this. Um, look, I think this show has some really good potential. I love the name of it, JB and Steel. Um, I like what we're talking about. We're covering everything. We're not necessarily – zeroed in on one thing but we we talk about a lot of things you know what i mean so i really appreciate all the hard work you're doing love all the great ahl coverage that you're they're providing um all the great stuff you're putting out on flyers nitty gritty you got to check that out please check us out on steel flyers at steelflyers.com um also uh uh be sure to check us out on Twitter and on Facebook and all your media platforms, man. We are there. Please check us out. Also got a lot of great stuff on the website. So check that out as well, too. Thank you very much for watching. We'll catch you on the next JB and Steel show.